A big thank you to Jono and the team for leading us in worship this morning. And uh, I'm sure you feel like I do that we are definitely sailing through uncharted waters in the time and age in which we're living, not only in this country, but globally. And so this morning, I want us to, to look at this subject, courage not to quit. Courage not to quit. I don't need to tell you that, that life is hard, and sometimes it can be extremely disappointing. Often we pray for things, and those prayers aren't answered the way we would have liked them to be, the way we wanted. Many people, after suffering a major loss of one description or another, and they just basically stop living and just start existing. On the other hand, there are some people, no matter what life throws at them, they seem to have an amazing resilience to just keep on keeping on. And the Apostle Paul was such a man as that. And we read what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9 from the New Living Translation. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed and broken. We are perplexed, but we do not give up and quit. We are hunted down, but God <clears throat> never abandons us. We get knocked down, but we get up again and keep going. Now, where do you find the kind of resilience like that? to keep on going, when your whole body and your mindset just wants to give up. The classic teaching, I think, on the subject has got to come from the book of Job. Job's life was a complete mess. In 24 hours, he lost his entire wealth and all his children. And then after that, he contracted a very painful illness. Yet from Job's life, we learn some very valuable lessons. Let's look at what Job did when you feel like you just want to give up. The first thing you need to do when you feel like you want to give up is tell God how you feel. Tell God how you feel. After everything fell apart in Job's life, he says this in Job chapter 1 and verse 20. Job stood up and tore his robe in grief, then he shaved his head and fell to the ground before God. He physically and visibly expressed all his pain to God. He shaved his head as an act of humility, and then he fell to the ground and he worships. At any time you go through a major loss of whatever descriptions, there are four experiences you will go through. The first one usually is anger. Why did this happen to me? And the second is grief. <coughs> grief at what I've actually lost. And the third is shock. I cannot believe this is actually happening. And the fourth is fear. What on earth do I do now? What am I supposed to do with all of those emotions? You express them to God. You don't suppress them or repress them. You confess them. You just tell God about it. You see, God is a whole lot bigger than your emotions. It's okay to tell God exactly how you feel. God can handle all your complaints and all your questions. He can handle your fear, your doubt, and your grief because God loves you. And he is far, far bigger than your emotions. The thing I love about Job is that he is he's brutally honest. In Job 7 and verse 11, listen to this. He says, I cannot be quiet. I'm angry and bitter. I have to speak. When you have negative emotions in your life, if you swallow your emotions, your stomach is going to keep score. If we don't talk it out, you are going to take it out on your body. Job starts off with confusion. 
Why is this happening to me? And then he starts complaining. I don't like what's happening to me, he is saying. And finally, he starts making bold accusations to God. He's basically saying, you know, God, I don't think you're a very nice God. And God just takes it all. He handles it. And the right response to unexplained tragedy is not simply to just grin and bear it. No, God wants you to be absolutely authentic with him. God honestly is interested in all your struggles with him. God would rather have you wrestle with him than walk away in detached apathy. Lamentations chapter 2 verse 19 says this, Cry out in the night. Pour out your heart like water in prayer to the Lord. When was the last time you cried out at night? When was the last time you literally poured your heart out to God? Although Job questions God's wisdom and wonders what is actually going on in his life, at the, at the root of it all, he still trusts God. But you've got to get it out. The second thing, when you feel like you want to give up, is you accept the help of others. Because God does not intend for you to handle your pain, your loss, your grief, all by yourself. We need each other. And the first thing God ever said in the Garden of Eden was, it is not good for man to be alone. We are made to be in relationships. Here's the problem. Very often when people go through a major disappointment or loss or whatever description, we don't want to tell anybody about it. We want to keep it a secret. When you face a loss, a failure, a mistake, a crisis, the natural reaction is to withdraw. But God says, no, 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 no. That's a bad idea. You need friends at that point in your life. Listen again to Job. Job chapter 6 and verse 14. Even a despairing man deserves the de devotion of his friends, even if he forsakes Almighty God. There are going to be times in your life, and I have encountered this with many people, who will, you will say, I don't have faith right now. I am doubting God. I'm not sure if God even bothers to answer prayer. And that is when you need people to be able to say to you, you know what? That's okay. We will have faith, and we will trust God for you. When you can't pray, we will be praying for you. This is how we meet the needs of each other. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 11, encourage each other and give each other strength. That's God's command to bear each other's burdens. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, by helping each other with your troubles, you obey the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Love your neighbor as yourself. You know what I mean? Pain is the great equalizer. When you're in pain, it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, young or old, educated or uneducated, you are in pain, and we need to be able to help each other out in our pain. The third thing, when you feel like giving up, stop asking why. When you've gone through a loss, a crisis, and you feel prayer hasn't been answered the way you want it to, stop asking why. <clears throat> because it doesn't help. It only prolongs the pain in your life. Even Job had to learn this. In fact, Job asked a whole lot of questions. In the first 37 chapters of the book, it's Job asking questions. But eventually, he did stop asking why. In Job chapter 3, and verses 11 and 12, he asks, Why didn't I die at birth as I came from the womb? Why did my mother let me live? Why did she nurse me at her breasts? <laughs> in other words, here's a guy in so much pain. 
and despair. He's thinking, it really wouldn't have, it would have been better if I hadn't been born. Why, God, did you let me be born? Why did you let my mother conceive me? Why did you just let my mother let me starve to death instead of feeding me? Why, God, did you bring me into this world with all this despair and all this misery? And of course, that's a legitimate question. In fact, Job asks a lot of legitimate questions. Job chapter 3 and verse 20. Why let people go on living in misery? <clears throat> That's a good question. Why give light to those in grief? Why God? You see, it's human nature to ask why. And the reason we ask it is actually a misconception. Because we think if we can understand the reason behind our pain, then somehow it is going to make our pain easier. But it is wrong. It won't. An explanation is not going to comfort you. You need, well, you don't need an explanation. You need strength. You don't need an explanation. You need a savior. You need comfort. You need support. But we always go looking for an explanation. Friends, I have to tell you, I've been trying to answer the why question for many years. And after many years of searching and trying to find, I want to give you the research that I have found. And I want to give you a very profound statement and answer this morning. Here it is. I don't know. And I'm never going to know. Why? Because I am not God. And nor are you. Some things we are never going to understand until we get to the other side of death, which is heaven. Then it's all going to become clear. So you may as well stop asking why, because you're just prolonging the pain. Proverbs 25 and verse 2 is a wonderful little verse. It says this, It's God's privilege to conceal things. God reveals, but he also conceals. You wouldn't know anything about God except that God has revealed it in nature, in circumstances, and, of course, in the Word of God, the Bible. But the Bible says that God also conceals. And sometimes God intentionally hides His face from us. Why? So we'll learn to trust Him instead of trusting our feelings. So we'll live by faith rather than by sight. Why doesn't God just make Himself known to everybody? Why doesn't he just make everything perfectly clear from the beginning of our lives right to the end? Shall I tell you why? Because if he did, it would scare us to death. We wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. So God intentionally conceals some things. So you might as well relax and stop asking why. You see, God doesn't owe you or me any explanation for anything. God doesn't have to get your permission before he allows certain things to happen in your life. God is God, and we're not always going to understand what happens. In 1 Corinthians 13, verses 9 and 12, I'd, I'd like to just paraphrase it a little bit in my own language. It says, right now, at this moment, we only know a little. We only know in part. Right now, we see things imperfectly, like they're being reflected in an old dodgy mirror. But then, in heaven, we will see everything with absolute, perfect clarity. All that I know now is just partial and incomplete. But then, I will know everything fully, 
and completely. Someday it's all going to be clear and it's going to make sense. One day you're going to see in heaven that that was why this was happening. That was why God allowed this to happen in my life. Sometimes you pray about things that you want so badly. Your heart is about to break, but then you don't get what you want. In that moment, you are tempted to doubt God and doubt the power of prayer. That's often normal. Even Job doubted at one point. Job 21 verse 15. Who is the Almighty? And why should we obey Him? What good will it do if we pray? You hear it? Sometimes you pray and when you don't get what you feel like you should, then you feel like God has just let you down. And then we take this illogical jump and say, God doesn't love me anymore. And you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. You will never understand how much God loves us. Let me tell you something. God cannot love you any more or any less than he does right at this moment. You can't make God stop loving you. Why? Because God is love. We always get into trouble when we doubt God's love. Instead of asking why, let's take the next step when we feel like giving up. And that is trust God in things I simply don't understand. The fact is, God always answers prayer. He doesn't always answer the way I want. In fact, there are many answers to prayer that God can give you. Sometimes God answers prayer with a simple yes or no. Sometimes he answers it with a, not, not yet, just wait. And sometimes, and let me tell you, I've heard people pray some things and I think, goodness gracious, what are you praying? And, and I imagine as they pray those prayers that God is saying, what? Are you kidding me? Sometimes God answers a prayer with, why don't you be the answer to that prayer? And sometimes God just says, trust me. Trust me. You're not going to know this one, so trust me. For 37 chapters, Job asked God why, and then in chapter 38, he stops, and then God turns to him and says, okay, Job, now I want to ask you some questions. And for the next two chapters, God asks Job Questions that only God can answer. For example, he says things like, Hey, Job, where were you when I created the universe? Tell me something, Job. Can you make the rain come out of the clouds? And Job realizes after listening to God's questions, Who on earth am I to be questioning God? You don't have the capacity. If you, if you could understand why God does everything he does, you'd be God, but you're not. There's no way that a finite human being has the ability or the comprehension to understand an infinite God. You just don't have the capacity. So there are some things I have to trust God for. I don't understand him. Sure. They don't make sense, but I'm going to trust God in the things I simply don't understand. Job acknowledges that. Then he stops questioning, and he starts trusting. Look at Job 42, verses 1 to 3 and verse 6. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything, that, and no one can stop you. You ask, who is this that questions my wisdom with such Ignorance, and Job admits, it is I. 
I was talking about things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me. God, I take back everything I said, and I sit in dust and ashes and show my repentance. Job says, I didn't have the capacity to understand the ways and the wisdom of God. I'm sorry. I was wrong. I should have just trusted you. Now, what do you do when you're in a situation and you simply just don't see what God sees and it makes no sense? You remind yourself of the things that you know of God that are true. And you publicly affirm those in the midst of all the things you don't understand. This is exactly what Job does. He reminds himself, and you can look through the book of Job. He says, I know that God is good and God is loving. I know that God is all-powerful. I know that God notices every detail of my life. I know that God is in control. I know that God has a plan for my life. I know that God will protect me. And he affirms in the middle of his doubts the things he knows are true of God. And you and I need to do this. Make those affirmations of faith. After doing this, Job comes to a decision. I may not understand it, but I'm going to trust God no matter what. Job 13, verse 15. Those wonderful words we all know. Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. He said, God, I'm going to trust you, even if you end my life. The ultimate test of faith is, God, I don't understand it, but I know you're a good God, and I'm going to trust you no matter what. You see, what some of us fail to realize, you weren't made to live forever on this planet. You were made for something far more. This, this, this earth, this planet, this is just a stopover. You ought to thank God that you aren't going to live on this earth forever with all the sorrow, the suffering, the sickness, the sin, the abuse, the perversions, the war, the crime, the hatred the corruption, the evil of this world. You were made for something far more and far greater. The next thing Job did when you feel like giving up was refuse to become bitter. When Job lost everything in his life and then got ill, here's what he said. Job ch chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. I came naked from my mother's womb, and I shall have nothing when I die. The Lord gave me everything I had, and they were his to take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. Job said, I didn't bring anything to this world, and I'm not going to take anything out of it. I'm just going to bless the name of the Lord, because everything I have is his anyway. You know something? Grief is good. Bitterness is bad. Sorrow and grief will not harm you, but resentment and bitterness, let me tell you, will destroy you. Remember that resentment prolongs the pain. It doesn't relieve it. It just reinforces it and makes it worse. You need to realize that, God, that grief is God's tool to simply help you transition into the next stage of your life. It's how you move from one loss to the next chapter or stage of your life. Ecclesiastes says there's a time and a, and a purpose for everything. There are seasons of grief in life. But hear this. You cannot let a season of grief become a lifestyle of grief because it will destroy you. 
In other words, there's a difference between mourning and moaning. There's a difference between weeping and wallowing. At some point, you've got to let it go. Listen carefully. Losses deepen me, but they don't define me. Losses are part of my maturity, but they are not part of my identity. It's something that happened to me, and it's over, and I'm moving on. Another thing you need to realize is that when you go through problems, God gives you grace in that moment. God gives you just enough grace for today. And tomorrow, He will give you just enough grace for tomorrow. If you start worrying about something that is going to happen in 10 days, 3 months, a year's time, what is this pandemic going to do? Will I get infected? Am I going to die? That's crazy. Because God is not going to give you grace today for something that's not going to happen for 10 days or 10 months' time. So you know what you're doing? You're simply borrowing trouble. That's why it's so senseless to worry. Because you, when you worry, you are borrowing trouble that you don't have the grace for yet. You must live one day at a time. When Jesus taught us to pray, he did not say, give us this day our monthly bread. God says, I'm going to give you one day at a time. Here's the problem. Some people are going to give you the wrong advice. <laughs> Family members, friends, are going to give you the wrong advice. Listen to what Job's wife said to him. Job 2, verses 9 and 10. Are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. But Job replied, you are talking like a godless woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all of this, Job said nothing wrong. Job refused to become bitter and resentful because it doesn't relieve the pain. It just increases it. Hebrews 12 verse 15 says, Watch out that no bitterness takes root among you. It, come, it causes deep trouble, hurting many in their spiritual lives. Friends, pain and suffering are inevitable. Misery is optional. It's your choice. There's one last thing, and I want to close with this, that Job did. When you feel like giving up, face the future with courage. Face the future with courage. Job 11, verses 13 to 18. Zophar, Job's friend, says this. Put your heart right, Job. Reach out to God. Put away evil and wrong from your home. Then face the world again, firm and courageous. You need courage to face the future. Then all your troubles will fade from your memory, like floods that are past and remembered no more. Your life will become brighter than the sunshine at noon, and life's darkest hours will shine like the dawn. You will, have, you will live secure and full of hope. Those of you who have any kind of had any kind of major loss in your life know what I'm talking about. That chapter in your life book is closed. But it's not the final chapter. You are still alive. That means the final chapter of your life has not yet been written. So get on with your life. Face the future with courage. And if you're prepared to do these six things that I've told you Job did, then like Zophar said in chapter 11, your life will become brighter. 
You know, one day, when I get to heaven, I want to say to Job, thank you, Job. Because you had no idea what was going on in your life. You didn't see the warfare and all that Satan was throwing at you. But you did it right. And life ended up brighter. Thank you, Job. Because, you see, Job, you helped me with some of the issues of my own life. I want to close in prayer, but first reading this wonderful scripture in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 11. We pray that you will be filled with this mighty, glorious strength so that you can keep on going no matter what happens always full of the joy of the Lord. Father, how we want to thank you this morning for a man like Job and the lessons that we can learn. Thank you, Lord, that as we are filled with all that you have for us, that this mighty, glorious strength which you can give us, you will help us keep on going. When the doubts assail us, when Satan throws everything he can at us, just like he did at Job, we pray that we will keep our eyes fixed on you, the author and the finisher of our faith. And we pray this today in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. May God bless you all.